Hello, Photopillar, Rafael de Barra here. Welcome to another masterclass. Today, we're going to learn a lot on landscape photography with the great Erin Bandnick. Erin, how are you? Thanks for being hey, on the show. Hey, Rafa. I'm doing great. Really excited <laughs> to be here today. Uh, you know, Erin, I've been missing you, you know, all the parties in uh, October in Photoplus, New York, with Michael Shamblum, Josh Creeps, and all our friends. Yeah. Tough years uh, for being out there shooting. Yeah, <laughs> this year's been tough. I, I look back to going back to those days when we're all hanging out together in New York. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. And other places. Super, super fun. <laughs> it's awesome. So, uh, well, guys, that you were there in the chat, feel free to ask any question because uh, Sandra Vallaura is always is in the chat and she will be sending us the questions. So please feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat and Eri will answer them for you. And Eri, I know that there, is, there are a lot of people in uh, the Propils community that don't know you. So who is Eri Bandic? <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, yeah, so um, what, what I'm not is really much of a like night sky Milky Way moon master type. So that's why a lot of the photo pillars uh, may not be familiar with me. Um, but I am a landscape photographer and there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I do enjoy shooting Milky Way and moon uh, with my workshops, but it's not something that figures really largely in my own work. Um, but uh, who I am, I, I have offices on two continents, both in Europe and in California. Um, mm -hmm. I specialize in wilderness landscape photography. Uh, so I prefer to be as remote as possible just because it's the place where I can discover new things and hear myself think. And I really enjoy that. So my, a lot of my workshops um, are in that same vein where I take people out into remote areas. I even have other mostly adventure style workshops where we might be backpacking out to remote mountain mm -hmm. refuges, or we might be taking monster trucks out into the highlands of Island, Iceland. Or <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I know that your workshops. What's that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know that your workshops are pretty crazy. <laughs> pretty yeah, awesome. Some, some of them, some, some are more, more, more same than others <laughs> but, um, yeah uh, so I have a huge variety of them but uh, yeah so I do workshops all over the world I do a lot of speaking all over the world I do a lot of writing and I'm a canon explorer of light I think those are the, that's it me in a nutshell that's a that's a great honor uh, and congratulations for for being one of the these small group of photographers that yeah. have the honor to be a, a canon explorer of light so for, for us it's a pleasure to have for the first time in the photo pills, uh <laughs> YouTube channel, uh, I can't answer that line. So Erin, what are we gonna learn today with you? Uh, so today my, my presentation is called Understanding Landscape, Six Elements of Photographic Style. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a topic that a lot of people find uh, fascinating and yet difficult to talk about. So you won't find very many presentations or discussions even uh, of style, although, some people take a whack at it. <laughs> they don't all come out very similar, unlike a lot of discussions of technique where things tend to be a little more predictable and repeatable. Um, but what I like to be able to do, because I have a background in art history, I was an art historian before I was a photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was an art oh. uh, painter before that and a graphic designer. So art it, I, it has really been the one thing that has characterized my entire adult life. And so I'm steeped in it and I love talking about it. And what I want to be able to do today is, is share my thoughts on photographic style uh, with people who would like to take their photography beyond the, the predictable, the repeatable mm -hmm. into that realm of, of producing something that is more personally rewarding uh, and that they can truly feel it is their own. Well, I can't wait to listen to what to what you have to say. So you want, uh, we can jump right onto the presentation. All right, let's do it. Let's share it. Awesome, here, here we go. Okay. So. That's nice. <laughs> Yeah, just something fun that I done recently. <laughs> Kicks things off with a little atmosphere. You gotta love purple atmosphere, right? <laughs> wow, nice shot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so um, so photographing a landscape is unlike some other genres in that you 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 know it doesn't require you have having to choose 
um, shoes or style models. Uh, you don't have to set up a studio. You don't have to craft your light with light modifiers or light gels. Uh, you don't have to pose or physically position your subjects and you don't need to talk to them in order to coach the right expression out of them. Although I guess um, you never know if it was those few well-chosen words that finally parted those clouds for you. But for these reasons and more, many people find it difficult to understand how landscape photography can showcase photographic style, how found scenes and available light um, can offer avenues for creative expression. Mm -hmm. So today, I would like to leave you with a better understanding of the most important space in landscape photography. Not the space that surrounds you when you're out shooting, but the distance that exists between all that you can see and the ideas that you bring to it. That creative space that exists not only within the photos that you create, but between each of them and between you and other photographers. If you can appreciate that space and understand all that goes into it, then you can use this understanding to make decisions that will lead to more personally rewarding images. You can use this understanding to see or to find something of your own self in your photos. Understanding this dimension is where we get the popular idea of finding your style. And that's a popular way of describing the process. But often this idea of style gets confused with the notion of quality, which can be very unhelpful, I think. And that confusion comes from assertions that style is something that you own. It's something that must be easily recognizable. Assertions that style is something difficult to achieve. These sorts of explanations try to equate style with quality, essentially. Okay. That equation doesn't always compute. This is a quote from David Bales and Ted Orland um, that I really like. It's out of their book called Art and Fear, which you if you haven't read, it's, it's a, a great source of inspiration for a lot of people in any artistic field. Style is not an aspect of good work. It is an aspect of all work. Style is the natural consequence of habit. So do you have a habit? of photographing certain types of subjects, for example. And I think I'd like to qualify the word habit by saying that this isn't necessarily something that you do um, religiously and entirely without thought. It can also be thought of as something that you do out of just sheer preference. But certain types of subjects, do you have a habit of, of photographing them in, in ways that might result in a variety of different um, Images, types of images. Do you have habits in your sense of timing? That's something that a landscape photographer can definitely have. And you can have habits of timing that carry across the continents. You might have habits of composition. I think that's a big source uh, of preferences and things that you might like to do repeatedly. And those habits might tend to appeal to you in a variety of different settings. You might have habits of technique that give shape to your work in a variety of creative solutions. The techniques that this photo has in common with the last one include the use of an 11 millimeter focal length and my split toning technique, even though they're very different photos. And this photo and this one both make use of my color theory techniques, post-processing, mm -hmm. as well as my nip and tuck blending technique. But I think it's fair to say that these photos don't look like cookie cutter instances that lack variety. It's just that if you're working from a, a set of interests that play out from one photo to the next, then that's what makes up your style. 
So style evolves out of what you tend to like and, and the choices that you tend to make repeatedly. What I'd like to do today is help to help you to identify and to understand those choices so that you can tap into that, that understanding, that fundamental understanding of yourself and to feel more confident about your landscape photography and consequently to produce work that rises to a higher level of personal reward. And also through all that I'm going to show you today, I hope that you'll learn a lot about the art and craft of landscape photography in general. So let's break down those decisions that I just discussed and those types of habits and preferences uh, into a few categories that can make them a little easier to remember and to think about. So your style, um, as I like to uh, organize it, basically consists of these things. What you find, what you form, and what you feel. And we can actually organize it a little further and break it down further for those of you who like that kind of thing. So let's do that. <laughs> so finding, forming, feeling, you find, if you can think of it this way as like a, an entity, finding that's like the bones of your picture. The form, that's the skin, what's on the outside, what you really notice. And what you feel, that's the soul, the inside of that entity. So in landscape photography terms, you find, you find the bones of the thing, and that could be finding features or it could be finding conditions, ephemera, things that are ephemeral that, that don't last. Uh, and what you form in landscape photography, that can be sort of the skin of the thing, right? The composition, for example, is a big one, or effects that you might uh, employ, and that could be all the way through anything to do with, with technique, so techniques in the field or techniques in post-processing. And then, um, you know, what you feel. And that's really where the fun part comes out, I think. And that's, the, that's, that's where you get to put on your artist beret <laughs> and put a lot of yourself into the image. That's the soul of the image, the mood that you impart and the stories that you're trying to tell. So let's look at the first one, what you find. I said that's sort of features and ephemera. Now I love finding stuff, and I've written about this and spoken about this a lot. Um, I, I have a, many articles and talks on exploration. In fact, I'm doing a whole talk on exploration about a month, I think, at, uh, through this the Kelby One Outdoor uh, mm -hmm. Photography Conference. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Um, but you know. Exploration doesn't have to necessarily mean going, like you know, way out into these uh, distant, remote reaches of the planet and and, uh, and off the charts and that sort of thing. Although it could be, and actually, for me, I'm just going to turn off my notifications here because I noticed I didn't do that already. Um, for me, um, it's it has been that, but it can also be just the. It could be also finding things that that just happen in places where you where you go a lot. So that would be you know finding those conditions or those ephemera, that wonderful little necklace of clouds that will never maybe never be there again. Um, it can be that, um, or it can be going into places where maybe they aren't that remote. You know you don't have to walk that far from the car, um, but you find something that. Uh, that that is new to you at least and you find it through just following your own nose and being being curious and all of those decisions that go into putting you in that place to do that will come out of your preferences you might find the way that features on the ground also combine with ephemera or conditions for example you might find a place where the sun can nicely rake across layers of land layers of features um, at a certain time of day or a certain time of year. That's something that you can find, those, those times when things can happen for you in a magical way. And for those of you who love photographing the moon, um, you know, that might be finding the time when the moon is in that perfect alignment, right? That's a huge part of it. Or finding a time when, um, you know, the the, the, the light will just rake across that land, that landscape and pick out the features of your foreground and you get the moon and you get the, the long line <laughs> leading to the moon. And 
getting all those things to come together, you know, that's something that you find. So what you find, uh, you know, evolves out of what you seek. And this can be done in a lot of places, perhaps everywhere. Um, you know, even, even in Iceland. <laughs> um, <laughs> Iceland is a place a lot of people think, oh, there's just about five waterfalls there. And that's really all that's there. <laughs> and you're going to have to jockey for position with 200 other people if you go. That's not true at all. Iceland's a wonderful country full of all kinds of things that you can find off the beaten path. So this is just a, a wonderful a spot that, that we found during one of my workshops uh, where we found this incredibly red, beautiful red volcanic soil with all of these, you know, mossy green features that Iceland is so well known for. Um, and this little patch of, of red soil wasn't much bigger than maybe, a, a, I don't know, 20 meters across or something. And then the rest was black. But, you know, when we found it, it was really fun to work with that and make it look like it, it fills the landscape. These are, these are all solutions that you can find. Um, you can find all kinds of cool stuff in, in Iceland. Uh, finding these little whorls on the edges of windblown lakes. Uh, they're not always there. But sometimes you can find them. Now, in these cases, we were going out very remote in uh, expedition style and monster tracks and these nine days of, of being out there when we didn't see any other photographers but those in our group. So yes, that in that case, that's that's going very remote. But it's not always that. There are scenes that you can find where basically you just or turning around or looking the other way or using a different focal length while being in a, a location that is actually fairly popular. So this is taken um, just during an opportune moment with the 400 millimeter focal length uh, in Death Valley National Park, right next to a very, very popular uh, spot for photography. This example here is something that um, you know, it was really fun for me to photograph, really fun for me to find. And all it is, is something that I found at the, uh, right along the side of a road at the bottom of a torrent where there were, it had actually been improved a little bit to uh, create more water flow <laughs> and um, uh, to, and it was building up like this, uh, be, partially because of man-made interventions. But um anything but remote. <laughs> okay, my car was like 20 <laughs> feet away from me. And sometimes you just find stuff in the midst of chaos. Uh, these places where uh, it's not at all obvious and then these shapes appear to you. And I love the rainforest and forests in general for that. So this is a rainforest scene from Washington and I saw this big creature or big mouth or something this, this <laughs> freeway into this other you know realm or something i really got my imagination going and uh it's wonderful when that can happen when you can find some order in the chaos sometimes you can find things just by looking down at your feet these are little bubbles um in ice in a lake in slovenia and sometimes you can find things um just by waiting. <laughs> um, so this this scene happened after a, a, a lot of atmosphere moved very quickly, and uh, you know it happened for a moment, and then it was then it was gone. Uh, ephemera is fun that way. Atmosphere is really fun. It's almost like shooting sports when it's really moving quickly. Features can be alignments that aren't just moons, but can also be aligning something on the ground with something behind it, like water. Uh, and um, and peaks. Now, if this image looks familiar to you, that's probably because I brought about three or four hundred people here by now. <laughs> but when I first found it, it was way before uh, the era of social media, and uh, was not at all obvious to go here. In fact, I was told by this is in Italy, and I was told by an Italian. Um, didn't I know that the proper place to photograph these peaks was way over there by this hut where you could have a beer and shoot at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know that's that another. I was doing it wrong. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. You, got it, you, you got it right. <laughs> that's you. another way of, of living in photography, right? You know, beer and... <laughs> <laughs> no, I will say there's something to be said for that, but... Uh... <laughs> But I kind of like this button, so I've been bringing people there uh, ever since. 
Yeah, so lining lining water with peaks is, is really fun. And especially these little, uh, that's that's just seasonal runoff that I was showing in that last image. And so is this. Um, this is um, a little, I, I have not seen this happen in many years um, like this. So it's, um, you know, it's it, these are fortuitous moments sometimes, but uh, oftentimes, you know, it's something that, that is repeatable and will come back. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes you can just find little itty bitty things to align with stuff. Uh, this, what looks like a big stripe leading off into the distance is, is probably about two meters, you know, <laughs> that's the beauty of wide angle lenses. Uh, if you're willing to, you know, get down and get low and get close, the smallest little feature suddenly can be a big discovery for you. Or it's finding that time of year when the light just happens to get through the cracks of other mountains and illuminate some peaks that interest you. This little, I call this one on the shoulder of giants because these peaks are actually much smaller than the ones uh, around them. Uh, but that one in the center of uh, especially really charms me. And there's not many times of the year when the sun can get right down in there. So sometimes it's a matter of figuring that out and photo pills is awesome for that kind of thing. In fact, I did use photo pills for that. Um, it's just finding the right shutter speed sometimes. So I often use this image to discuss what <laughs> decisions I made with shutter speed on this waterfall because ordinarily sort of the go-to solution with waterfalls is to try to smooth them out. And this is just a beast of a waterfall that doesn't take that well. It looks raggedy and messy and it doesn't smooth out nicely because it's so cool how this water actually shoot, it hits this little lip and shoots upwards with great force before it all comes falling back down again. And that waterfall has been carving that groove in the rock opposite it for what, millions of years? Um, that's, that's a powerful waterfall. There's a story there and freezing the, the, motion a little bit, I think helps to do a better job of it than making it be all silky and smooth. Although that works in a lot of cases too. So you might find times when an area transforms. Uh, the, the, some areas of Death Valley National Park flood with water and um, completely transformed sometimes. A lot of people complained this year when this area, all of the salt ridges got melted down by very, very deep water. Uh, I was wading through at points that were up to my knees and um, there were opportunities in there. So the main polygons uh, were not very distinct, but there were these, there was this wonderful like lace like, like bowl um, that I was uh, able to emphasize and show off. And uh, that's just from, from finding a way to work with some very unusual conditions. So I love finding those, those sorts of moments where you can, one thing I found this, this salt creek, and it's one that I've been taking my students to for years now, um, but then finding what you can do with them. Um, what sorts of alignments might work out? Would uh, the sun setting behind it work out? Would the sun setting um, to illuminate the mountains work out? I also have a shot like that coming soon, actually, that I just shot recently. Um, and finding, like I said, the, those moments of light that pick out whatever it is that interests you. If you found that, that's, that's because of some interest that you had that led you to seek it out. And sometimes finding just means finding something that you don't feel as though you've seen before, something that's just quite strange. <laughs> and um, that for me is, is a huge source of fun, is finding the strangeness in the landscape and sometimes the moments when the atmosphere just makes it all the more strange because of what it conceals and reveals. So what you find, how about what you form? So what you form, um, that can break down to these things, as I mentioned, composition and effects. Now, I just showed you that, that waterfall. Um, now, this, this waterfall, there, there could be a lot of ways to compose it. 
And there can be a lot of ways, um, you know, to, like, as I said, to uh, present it with, with whatever technique you use, shutter speeds or whatever. Um, but in this case, just finding a beautiful framing that could show off what that waterfall has been doing for so many years and a way to show off the way that the light can get behind it and, and light up all of that mist um, for me required just a very kind of simple frame composition. And I like to use those a lot. It's something that a lot of photographers like to use. I don't own that. <laughs> okay. It's actually a very straightforward solution. And that's the case with a lot of stylistic decisions. In fact, probably all of them. Um, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and we all borrow, but it's the way that you decide to combine what it is that you're uh, exposed to, which is a lot. Ever since we're children, babies, and we can first see, uh, we're exposed to visual solutions that may inspire us and may stick with us in ways that we don't even remember or recall. And it's really just a matter of selecting those ones that you wanna work with that will ultimately determine your style. So uh, compositionally, I have a lot of go-to options, but also, you know, with effects. Um, you know, here, are the, the effect of the last one I described with the, the shutter speed of the water, here I used a longer shutter speed to show off blowing wind. Why? Because it tells the story of how those sestrugi, that's the word, the Italian word for the wind carved snow, how the sestrugi were formed. They were formed by... Uh, the wind carving the snow. So I, I really was happy to be able to show that process uh, as part of the nature story. Now, composition isn't one of those things that's always easy. It's something sometimes you really have to struggle at it. In fact, I think if the more, the more that you tend to really explore and work out and the more that something kind of challenges you, the more that your, your own habits and your own preferences are going to come out. I have a couple of different ways that I tend to work and I call one the, the sort of the hierarchical solution. And that's usually with the grand landscapes where there's something that gets prominence in the frame. And I have a habit of looking for that when I'm looking at larger scenes. So I have a whole article on that called um, five compositional patterns worth finding in nature. And another one called does landscape, do landscape photographs need a subject? So you can look at the workshop reading list on my website under workshop mm -hmm. um, if you want more on that. But here, um, you know, I have this uh, habit of finding something that that is uh, in some way standing out, not necessarily the subject. I'm not as comfortable with that word as a lot of other people are because I think it confuses form with meaning. Uh, and in this case, the top of a white butte um, has, a, has a lot of different other features that, that feed into it and that connect with it. And I have a habit of looking for those sorts, sorts of things. Uh, when I first started photographing mud tiles, this was in um, the end of 2014 and especially early 2015, um, I went a direction, well, there weren't very many mud tile images at all back then. Um, they weren't, they weren't very, it wasn't really a go-to. Um, and so I had, I had to figure it out and that's really fun. And I, I quickly settled on these sort of wagon wheel and sort of horseshoe bend solutions <laughs> to composition. And I riffed off of myself for, for years uh, with these sorts of ideas. So here we have, we have the rat wagon wheel. I was very fortunate to have that, um, uh, fortuitous rainbow drop, literally dropped down into my frame when I was already uh, <laughs> set up for that. <clears throat> but, you know, here's that sort of horseshoe bend, bend effect. Um, but I love also to have some kind of visual payoff in the background. So for me, it's not quite enough just to have the horseshoe bend. I want something else back there for all that emphasis and flow to take the eye into the back of the frame. You know, I, I want there to be something back there to get people excited when the eye gets back there. And so it might be the moon or it might be something like a sun star. A sun star, again, that's something that's ephemeral. Uh, and also that's something that is an effect, right? So that's, this isn't just a matter of composition. This is a matter of making decisions technique-wise, what effects you choose, to create something that actually isn't even there. The sun is there, but those spikes 
to the naked eye or not, right? That's something that the lens produces. It's a, it's a feature of your, your lens being able to um, use its aperture, the number of aperture blades that it has to, to uh, really make the light uh, splay out like that. So that's something that you that you can create and you may find yourself really enjoying that effect and going to it as a solution when you need something something back there <laughs> that is an object <laughs> there it can be it can work uh, another thing that I like to go for, if you haven't noticed already, uh, besides strangeness, which I mentioned, I love strangeness, uh, is symmetry. And the reason is because even though you you may have heard um, in other genres of photography, you know that we we should be cautioned against symmetry or centering or any of that, it's because in some other genres of photography, symmetry and centering can cause a static composition. Good luck making a landscape static. That's pretty hard to do because landscapes are chaotic. Right, this stuff is pretty not regular, <laughs> <laughs> so you're never going to have perfect symmetry in a landscape, or else it's extraordinarily rare. And so that's why it can be really, uh, really um, rewarding to the viewer when they the, that sense of organization registers to them that you've tried, tried to find some way to impose some order on the chaos. And so that's that's really a, a go to solution for me in a lot of cases because it's actually fairly difficult to do. It's not it's not a complicated idea. And again, it's not something that I own, hard, far from it. Um, but it's something that I go to. And, and when others might prefer counterbalance, which I, I also do, but I really, really enjoy being able to find a, a, a good um, symmetrical composition. So uh, I like I said, I repeat these these ideas over and again. Here we've got the sun star and the uh, the mountain in the middle, um, and I'm okay with that. You know, that's something something that I do because I enjoy it. Now, these are older photos that I'm showing you. A lot of this work that you're going to see today is is not my newer work, um, and I feel as though some of it, if I were to do it today, I would almost feel like I'm just uh, I'm, I'm too being too repetitive, repeating myself too much. So you won't see me doing a lot of these similar sorts of things. I've moved on to other interests, but the threads carry through. Um, so I still love um, you know, jagged mountains, but I'm using a lot more telephoto these days. And rather than looking for immersive front to back compositions, sometimes I find more circular ones. Um, but my interests still carry through in uh, the sorts of things that I choose and, and how I choose to photograph and, and also in how I present them. Going back to, to an older image again, this is actually a moon scene uh, from Death Valley. So back in my older work, I was I was looking for ways to impose order on, on the chaos. And the moon is, is actually a fun way of doing that, just like with with the sun. Um, it gives that little sense of that, that that's something the enlivener, I, ca I call it. Uh, and it's, it's that thing that's in the frame that seems to somehow give a sense of, of meaning to, to everything. And a lot of different techniques can be used to photograph the moon, you know, wide angle, telephoto. Um, but in, in any case, whenever you've got the moon in the frame, it's hard for it not to be the thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's the thing that makes it special and magic. Um, and it's just a mat, but, but regardless, through all these types of different approaches to the moon will be the ones that, you know, that appeal to you. There are a lot of different ways to go about it, in other words. So uh, in also in the category of effects, focus stacking. Um, that's something that I started doing, of course, first, um, well, I shouldn't even say of course, but for me, it was wide angle, so-called vertorama is what I've already been showing you. Um, and it, eventually, as I transitioned to more telephoto interests, I started doing those. This is a 400 millimeter scene of some sand dunes in Death Valley um, that required three shots, focus stacked together. Um, but that's something that gives me solutions in the field that wouldn't necessarily work any other way. And the more that you latch onto techniques that you like and you include them in your, your tool set, your go-tos, 
that you like, the more that you're going to be able to pull those threads through your work and that you're going to be able to find the things that match with all that other stuff that you like, such as finding symmetry. Here's another exa example of uh, focus stacking. It's also an example of what we call a vertorama. So that's another technique that I like to employ. So that's when you angle the photo down for part of your composition and then you angle the camera, if I say photo, <laughs> angle the camera up um, for the top part, right? So, you know, you might have a series of horizontal frames that are stitched together vertically rather than across the image. So like a panorama, you get a vertorama. Uh, and this is another example of doing that. And this is Again, one of my older images, but I've been doing that for a long time. And it gives me the opportunity to try some things that maybe I, I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I think it, it's one of those threads that carries through. And sometimes you put them all together with the sun star and the focus stacking and the vertorama and everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and those decisions tend to be especially... Um, you know, the ones that, that you really like tend to be the ones that give form to, to your portfolio. So, yeah, getting out there and really, really feeling the technique and really putting it all into your images. And sometimes that could, these sorts of techniques might be something that involves just uh, timing and, and even post-processing. For example, in this one, um, uh, you may have heard the, the, term time blend. So that's something that I've been doing for many years. And when I have this fast moving atmosphere like this, I might be on a tripod and just sort of watching the atmosphere blow past. And I might use one little bit of one frame and another little bit of the frame that's five or six seconds around that one because the atmosphere is going so fast. And in this case, this is a com combination of the, so those long, uh, tails of atmosphere, the sort of fingers of atmosphere that are trailing off towards the right, um, are made more complete by using two different moments in time that are just a few seconds apart. So it gave them greater form just by blending them together. So sometimes these these are things that you, once you've decided that you like doing this, you'll think of it in the field and you'll shoot for them. And that too will make a big part of your style. And further on, when you get around to printing any of this stuff, that's a whole other realm of things <laughs> that you can do um, in the printing process. It might be the types of paper that you choose. It might be the scale that you like to print. Uh, a lot of people think that printing is just a matter of matching somebody's image with somebody's wall. And I actually don't feel that way at all. I feel as though some images need to be big and immersive and others benefit from being small and precious when they're printed. Uh, not the same type of paper is great for every image. Some images really come alive with, with their glossy acrylic and others really come alive with a, more of like a matte rag paper. It really, it really depends on the image and it's up to you, the artist, I feel, to make those decisions. So let's move on to what you feel. So, <laughs> like I said, Erin, we, we have a few questions. Do you have oh, yeah. time now to, to, to answer them? Good, it's always a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the first one is 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 mine. I mean, it's all about the, how many images. Uh, how long does it take for you to to decide uh, uh, an image is, is worth to be included in your portfolio? I mean, just to give us a sense of the amount of work you put in, in your photography and how selective you are. Um. um that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I know anybody, you're picky. <laughs> yeah, anybody who knows my work knows that um, I am, uh, that's a huge part of it, I think, is also what you choose to display. So I, I, I believe that artists should be very productive. You should always be working on your art. Um, but you don't have to show it all. And in this age of social media, where you ha people feel the need to feed an algorithm and just pump stuff out, because let's face it, if you don't do that, you don't grow. Um, fortunately, there are other ways to um, enjoy your photography, even if you're a professional. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a full-time 
landscape photographer enjoys a very successful career. And I put very little emphasis on running on that little hamster wheel of social media all the time and just churning stuff out because I think it's presentable. Um, but that, you know, it, it, to each their own. And some people have, <laughs> you know, different needs and different interests. And some people enjoy doing that. But what it takes for me is really, and that's a good question, Rafa, because it has everything to do with what I'm talking about today. Is those images that ultimately make it into my portfolio are those ones where I see myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I see myself in the photo. I, I think, yeah, that's that's me. I once had a friend said say about one of my photos when I first showed it to him. He said, that's got Aaron juice smeared all over it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> I think that's a compliment. <laughs> but yeah, if I, I feel as though um, you know, I, I see those threads there and I feel like it's it's really an, an expression of all my own interests. Uh, that's more likely to make it into my portfolio. Not just the oh. ones that I think are super presentable. Awesome. But, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. You talk about the find, how to find, and uh, Walter G uh, asked you if you can talk a little, a little bit on how you scout a location, just to give a, a few tips or hints yeah, we'll you're using. This one while we're talking about that. So, um, <clears throat> so I, um, I started because I started before there was uh, before the era of social media, it was in its infancy. That was back when Instagram, if it existed, and I, I don't think it did. But um, you know, back in the early days, it was mostly like forums and that kind of thing. Not much Instagram or Facebook or any of that. Um, so what I did was I didn't even. Re- I felt like I was working on an island. I wasn't even getting into photography because I even thought landscape photography was really a thing. Like <laughs> I was actually mm-hmm. an archaeological photographer. And um, I just got tired with all of the, um, you know, the constraints on everything that was involved in that. I wanted just the opposite, which is going out and running amok in the wilderness, right? So <laughs> my first instinct was just, let's just go, I don't know, somewhere, you know? And so that, that idea of just getting out there and finding things to photograph just because I want to be out and away and looking just came very naturally to me. And eventually I realized that that would actually maybe be a little more productive if I had some maps. And so I bought loads and loads of topo maps. And so that to this day is another way that I enjoy looking for things. You look for features like I was really into water when I first started photographing the Dolomites, for example. And that led me to find other things. But at first I was like, I wanted to know where every torrent, every river, every little glacial lake, you know, everything could be that I could, every cascade, you know, and so I would go looking for those and I learned where does the tree line end and I could extrapolate from information in one area to another without having to, um, you know, necessarily know anything about that area. I could just kind of go there and be like, all right, well, the tree line ends there and that feature is there. I'm probably going to find X, Y, and Z. Um, so to this day, I kind of still work that way. You know, I like to just go out and be curious and wander around, but I'm mostly interested in aesthetics. You know, so mm-hmm. where it was water in the in the beginning in the Dolomites led me to other interests that I was looking for aesthetically in the Dolomites. And then also uh, I was very interested in ice. So that got me out to the French Alps to look for glacial features mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Red tiles or whatever, you know, so I tend to be driven in that way, but that's another good question. Any other questions? Awesome. We have two more. Okay. You want, yeah. Then we have Don Bender. Um, let's see if I can read this. Question, in all seriousness, is lack of a discernible style in and of itself a style? Or is the lack of a discernible style just a stop on the journey towards one? Um, well, you I want mean, me to read, yeah, so that's read again? Question. So you're saying, um, it, so that's, that's, a, no, that's, that's going back to this idea of, of style being somehow very recognizable. And mm-hmm. I think that that's just too easy. A lot of people who are maybe new at looking at imagery don't recognize a compositional style uh, or they don't recognize other features of style. Uh, so what they might see is the easy stuff. Oh, this guy does mostly green photos, you know, or I'm often yeah. accused of purple, you know, oh, most of Aaron's photos are purple, which is actually not true. 
<laughs> but I do use it a lot. <clears throat> um, or, you know, most of Erin's photos are atmospheric or most of them are the Dolomites or whatever. So people will see things that are obvious. Um, but I would say that, that a lack of a discernible style is on the viewer, not the artist. That would be my answer to that. So the, what, makes, what makes a style is just that you're repeating some things that you do a lot. And whether or not anybody else notices that is irrelevant. Okay. okay. That question. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one from Sharon B. For focus stacking, how quickly are you shooting all the shots? I'm assuming you shoot three or however, or however many oh, uh, is... shots in a pretty close succession. Okay. So this is a focus stack shot that is three, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a focus stack shot that is only two. So it totally depends on your, actually this might also be three, but it mostly depends on your focal length and how close you are to things. Um, mm -hmm. I am now working on some images right now that I've taken at 500 millimeters <clears throat> that involve something like 32 focus points. Um, mm -hmm. But that's because mm -hmm. I'm working with things that are really close to a 500 millimeter lens and then out to infinity. <clears throat> and um, so that's, and, and I know that it needs that many because I'm actually, now I've got the Canon R5, uh, I can benefit from the focus stacking um, features of that camera. And I can tell it, you know, I want, I want to go from here to there and please don't do anything more than 50 shots and it'll come back with 32. And so I'm like, oh, okay, so that's all it needed. And then I can go back through those shots and see how many of them did it actually need. And usually with the, at that situation, it needed all of them. <clears throat> and so, yeah, sometimes you need a lot. But with these wide angle shots, usually it's not that many. And you can go, you can go as quickly as the light is still there for you to capture it. So, mm -hmm. for example, this is three shots at 400 millimeters because it's all very far away from me. So I didn't need, you know, 32 focus points. Um, but the light was going fast. This is twilight. Uh, it's getting darker and darker and my exposures are 30 seconds each, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have time to do more than about three. Um, mm -hmm. so it really, really varies. Did you begin uh, from, from the top or the bottom? I always start from the closest point, what's closest to me. Closest. And that's only because, um, well, let me qualify that. <clears throat> to be methodical, I will do that. But if something's really going on quickly in the mm -hmm. background, that's really cool. I, I always phrase it this way that let's say you're out in the field, it's a game of triage. <laughs> so <laughs> something really exciting is happening in the background. Let's say the unicorn's jumping over the moon. You want to catch the unicorn at the right moment, right? So you, you got to focus on that, keep shooting that and then <laughs> go back and now, okay, now the light has changed on the foreground. I already did a little focus stack for that, but I'm going to do it over again. Um, so, you know, it's, Whatever needs to get done, get it done. But if you have the time, be methodical about it so that it's just easier for you when you get back to your computer to know which what what what's what. <laughs> You're like, all right, if this is the first one in the sequence, then they're all gonna go from front to back. <clears throat> right Got there. it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So what you feel. My last section. And like what I said, feel? huh? What do you feel? I feel excited <laughs> to be here with you, Rafa. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> so that is, like I said, the mood and the stories that you want to tell. Now, sometimes the way you feel is just, I don't know, windblown, hungry, <laughs> tired, <laughs> full of sand. <laughs> um, could be a lot of things when you're out doing landscape photography. Um, but what you ultimately put into your photos, the images that come out of these times in the field, um, that that's that's that can vary a lot. It can it can really not be a reflection of how you actually felt in the moment, or or it can be. Uh, so get a, 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 you know this this image is a good example of what I mean by this because to, to me, you know, I wanted to provide this a, a kind of impressionistic. Um, soft pastel uh, view of, of the dunes. It is clearly windy, I think, um, but there's a certain kind of inviting quality about it that maybe you wouldn't expect from a, from a sandstorm. And I, and I think that that's true because I at once had a guy come to work with me from the Netherlands all the way to Death Valley. 
And I get a lot of people come from all over the world to work with me in Death Valley. But this particular guy um, came all that way because he'd seen this image in a magazine and he wanted to capture something like this. So on one and I, we were with a group workshop um, and uh, everybody was really excited about the idea of shooting Windy Dunes. So I thought, all right, well, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> and um, if we get the chance and we did. And when we got out there, he was like, whoa, what are we doing? Whoa, 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 what's this? And I was like, well, <laughs> it was you who said you want, you, you like that one Sandy Dunes image and you wanted to, he was like, well, I didn't expect this. Like, <laughs> it never occurred to him that in order to photograph an image like that it, it, of a sandstorm that you needed to be in the sandstorm, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so the connection between experience and, and the aesthetic or the story or the mood of the image uh, what was quite different for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, surprise, um, surprise. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, again, this has a lot to do with my choices in post-processing and my choices of shutter speed and all of, and all of that. So here's with those subtly purple shadows that I'm so often accused of. <laughs> right. All right. So this, this sort of thing, that these moody images, it's, it's, it is also part of what you seek out. So this day when these clouds came down to just to kiss the top of that dune, this was a wacky, completely freakish cloud inversion uh, in Death Valley. That was, uh, I was all by myself. I just went out there. And uh, after this, there were whiteout conditions that made it really just, I couldn't even see the dunes around me. Uh, it was really something. Uh, but uh, this kind of thing, it was that, that mood of that moment of this, this sense of tension of something that's about to happen. And I wanted to crank that up so high. I just made the most symmetrical composition I could so that all of the emphasis is on that one very highly charged par part of any frame, which is the center. And, uh, and that, that mood and those stories um, just sort of dictated everything else. And so that came very much out of, out of those interests that really do pull through a lot, a lot of my work. Um, so the story of the image is really very, very important to me. I have a whole talk that I think the NH will be putting on their website soon about stories, um, about storytelling and yeah. landscape photography, but I can give you a little taste of it here. And I use this image a lot to describe the three kind of ideas that I have about storytelling, which is that there can be that story of just nature, which is very straightforward. There can be that story about you, about your experiences, what you went through in the sandstorm or whatever. Um, and then there can be also that metaphorical level, the level where things mean something other than what's actually depicted in the frame. And this image, for example, you know, the nature story is, I think, pretty obvious. And I loved the connection between the fact that there's this uh, there's this synergy there where the, the rainbow and the mud tiles echo each other's forms. And they're both they're both created in the same way. You know, water comes down, it dries up, and the sun comes out, describes both of those features. <laughs> and I think it's kind of cool how the connection and form connects also that nature story. But also in this image, um, it, this was a time in my life and I was going through a lot of crazy stuff and it was pretty difficult for me. And there was this kind of story that went along with that for me about this, this kind of kind of messed up fractured past that I was coming out of and that shiny colorful future that I hoped lay ahead for me. And, and that right there, that even that, just that metaphor, the idea of something that can be kind of old and worn and leathered. And yet there's something young and ephemeral and uh, beautiful coming, coming out of it or coming soon. I think that's something that almost any culture can read into an image, whether they know you or your story or anything about nature or how anything's formed, those kind of metaphorical stories do tend to speak to people. And it, it helps if you can see that stuff in the, in the field. And if you can, that can have a big, uh, big effect on, on what your, what kind of style comes out of it. So I see stories all over the place. To me, this image of, uh, of a mountain in a snowstorm kind of reminded me of, uh, it's like a, a mountain just sort of like taking a shower in the storm. It's just a, it's a snow squall passing over the mountain. Uh, it, it has this incredible expressiveness for me that is very charming to me. I often see these sort of whimsical moments in my images. And that's what attracts me to choose that over something else. 
And I also love when it, atmosphere tends to interact with the landscape in interesting ways. So in this case, there seems to be this kind of dialogue between the atmosphere and the land, the way that the atmosphere is reaching out to grab that pyramidal peak that's catching the light at the same time. And that just as the glacier is coming down and other peaks are running up to meet it, it's, it's, it's like there's this convergence that's going on there uh, that does suggest a dialogue between the elements. Likewise, with this image uh, from the Eastern Sierra, this incredibly flat shelf of clouds as if it's covering the hills and blanketing them in a gesture of protection uh, really charmed me. Or this one from Death Valley, uh, that, that little strand of atmosphere that stuck around for days after a storm. I call this one the visitor. It's like that, you know, the visitor comes to crash on your couch and doesn't leave. Uh, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and you know, there, there's, it's almost as if uh, there's something, there's something going on there that's much more fun and much deeper and more meaningful than than just you know, moisture left over after a storm. And these stories can also be on a, a kind of allegorical level, or where you see something that's not actually there. Like this reminds me of water. Uh, to, to, it's just two layers of mud coming together in an interesting way in a river canyon. Um, but to me, I look, it looked like surf crashing at my feet on a, on a beach, the way it dithers out in the, the dry layer over top of the wet layer of mud. I saw snakeskin in these mud tiles. So again, that's something that's um, just using my imagination in, in a storytelling manner that is very, very go-to for me. It's very, it's something that I like to do a lot. And it will tell me to take a shot or, or not, or tell me to put a shot in my portfolio or not. If I see those, those, in, those stories there, I don't always see them in the field, to be honest. Sometimes it's when I'm selecting, culling my images and going through deciding which one to process. It's the one where the story comes out for me. And it may not be the story that even occurred to me in the field, but it does at that point. This in this case, I saw a rocket ship blasting off, for example. In this case, I saw an asteroid. If I wanted to tell a descriptive, if I wanted to show a descriptive photo of that mountain, this would not be the way to do it, right? But if I want to show an asteroid, that works. <laughs> or comment, I mean. <laughs> hmm. So sometimes it's it's these these illusions like that. And sometimes it's just that that strangeness that makes me wonder things that are kind of lie outside the actual descriptive qualities of the image. Like this, this Rembrandt light on this water creating this kind of strange, almost like sublime, scary series of voids and lit areas. It really makes me wonder what would it feel like to be that water rushing towards the chasm um, and and that can also be a great source of inspiration in the field. Sometimes I see elements that look like they're um, they're saying something. You know, to me that tree leaning out of the way of the light almost seems to like be like, "Hey guys, look over here!" or, or "Get out of the way! Something's coming." <laughs> there's there's a, there's you know almost an expressiveness there about them. Or in this one where the trees seem to be holding hands in this kumbaya moment as the sun rises up behind the fog in the morning. Or these trees that seem to gesture across the lake to their buddies. Hey, guys, what's up? How's the weather over there? Cool. You know, like, <laughs> I love finding these whimsical little moments uh, that give me ideas in the field. And sometimes they're just these these correlations, you know, the echo composition, which I wrote about in one of my articles is one I go to because it like the rainbow with the mud tiles, you know, here I've got a crack in the sky and a crack in the in the uh, cliff and these, these incredible, crazy amethyst like, clouds, the dolomites. And, and to me, there's there's again, there's that synergy there that just is ripe for storytelling. And images small and large can have this. This to me the, the way that these ferns gesture towards the waxalis, um, there's there's a number of stories that could be told there, you know. Is this a gesture of protection where those ferns are, are leaning in, they're circling around, or are they attacking them? <laughs> really <laughs> depends on the viewer. There's no right answer. So yeah, um, you know, these images, 
really speak to me sometimes. This one, I almost saw like this sort of like Titanic moment with someone that, that, that central peak, almost like it's standing on the bow of a ship with, you know, it's drapery fluttering behind it in the wind. Um, uh, there's, the, there's this wonderful expressiveness that tells a little story there for me. And I often say, and I have whole talks about this too, so this is just by the by, but what you intend as a story is one thing and what your viewer will receive or understand is another and that's okay that's how art works so style uh this is just what i have to say about it in closing and it's adapted from a quote from uh blaise pascal but this isn't quite what he said i'm just adapting it but uh this is one way of looking at it where we expect to find a photograph we find a soul the soul of the photographer and that is style. So in summary, what you find, what you form, and what you feel. Thank you. Awesome. I, thank you so much for this presentation. It's been just wow. So many, so many tools people can use to create stunning images. And some people it was like uh, saying thank you in the chat for the inspiring talk uh so refreshing uh it's been it's been amazing to, to have you here and what a beautiful images that you create Harry. thanks rafa it means a lot Bye. yeah yeah for uh, for people that um you refer to your website what, what's your website people want to, to find you edinbamnik.com and, and uh, on instagram social networks you're also Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can also find me at photocastcadia.com. Uh, Photocastcadia is a group of seven photographers. Uh, we're all nature photographers, and we just collaborate on stuff uh, such as books. We have this book out now, Oregon, My Oregon. Right. Um, and we do workshops together sometimes and stuff like that. So we're just a collective that are we're also friends. And yeah, so you can find me there. Yeah. Too. Your your good friends, yeah. And uh, in the in the photos Cascadia website, you you also have uh, like tons and tons of content and articles to learn photography, and it's an amazing resource. Yeah, we're going on twelve years now, and we twelve have, years. Yeah, so we have a massive collection of articles uh, on uh, of interest to photographers and every subject. Do you still do this annual crazy meeting together, or? Well, we had to skip it. For obvious reasons oh, yeah. last year. But yeah, we're uh <clears throat> we have we have a big house reserve for January and we're hoping we can do that. But our summits are pretty legendary. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get together. So usually the one time a year we can get all seven together if we even can. And we 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 have our meeting, but we also have a whole lot of fun. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And uh, I know a few of, of, of you guys and you're all beautiful people. So uh, I know Erin, uh, any last last uh, word you want to share with the audience before we we say goodbye? Uh, well, thank you very much for your your attention. Please stay in touch. You can sign up for my newsletter at erinbomnik.com to learn more about me and what I have going on. And yeah, stay out there. Do you have a do, do you have any any spot open for your workshops? Uh, everything's or? sold out at the moment, but I have a whole bunch of stuff that's listed as coming soon. That's kind of tentative, depending on how things work out. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of that. So, um, yeah, if you get on my newsletter, you'll know more about when those opportunities pop in. My stuff tends to sell out really quickly, like in, sometimes in an hour or a few hours. So uh, it does help to be on these lists so that you find out about them. It sounds like a, a good idea. So you guys, please go to her website, erinbabnik.com and join the newsletter to to keep tuned uh, with all that Erin is producing and workshops. And well, I think it's time to say goodbye. So thank you so much for watching us, for being there. And remember that you have the power to imagine, plan and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you, Erin. Bye. Peace, peace. Bye-bye.